Hello, everybody, and welcome back. We are going to uh, proceed with um, our next discussion on uh, digital therapeutics. So the field of digital therapeutics is moving quickly. Um, and you know we think of digital therapeutics as somewhat of a subset of the whole field of digital healthcare, digital medicine. We heard about some of the other aspect, uh, aspects of it earlier today, the use of artificial intelligence, looking at large data sets, the various types of benefits and cautions that we have about doing that, as well as uh, drug supply, drug pricing, et cetera. Um, but, but really when it comes down to it, it's uh, a big part of this is about the, the opportunity to change the therapeutic value proposition for patients. So um, the, field, the field of uh, therapeutics specifically is also advancing rap rapidly. Um, uh, to recap the optimism that we have in this forward, um, uh, the FDA has issued guidance. There's been, there's been progress in getting specific software approved as a therapeutic, landmark decisions just within the last two years. Um, a lot of promising data is being published in a variety of different diseases, diabetes, oncology, behavioral health, mental disease, et cetera. Um, but of course it's not easy. And in fact, uh, there are many challenges, many difficulties, especially many difficulties that small companies face going forward. Um, and in fact, uh, um, uh, a lot of small companies have to pivot around, away from their original uh, objectives of going to consumers, and over half wind up switching to a B2B business model. Um, and not, it doesn't affect just small companies, large companies have famously failed in a variety of different digital health applications, uh, m much with uh, digital healthcare records and you know the digitizing of personal records. I mean, almost every company now that we see get, getting back into it, like uh, Apple and and Google and Microsoft, have been here before, have failed, and now are coming back. And even some names that we no longer hear of, like Healthion, you know, one of the one of the highest profile blowups that, that, that's happened in this space. Um, so it, it kind of raises the question, what are, what are factors of success? And that's, that's what I'm going to pose as the theme of the discussion for this panel today. And you know, to, to you know, borrow the wor words of, uh, of Tolstoy, every digital company fails in the same way, but the ones that are successful are successful in their own special way. So um, let me let me introduce our speakers and kind of keeping that in mind about what is the special thing that made your company successful. So uh, actually, let me first go go down the line and I'll, I'll introduce everybody and then and then we'll come back to Lynn and ask her to to, to speak for a few minutes. So um, uh, Lynn Hamilton is the chief operating officer of Talkspace. Talkspace, uh, uh, if you haven't heard of the company, you've, you've probably seen the advert the ads on television and, and posters um, where they 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 uh, have Michael. Phelps as a spokesman for, uh, for behavioral health uh, and really helping level the play playing field in terms of access, remove the stigma, and, and uh, bring therapies forward. Um, her, her background is actually uh, on the uh, health system side, uh, and she has a consulting background before she took the leadership role at uh, Talkspace. Um, Eddie is a, a, a one of us, he's a Yale graduate uh, uh, and uh, has a PhD from Yale. Um, he's the founder and CEO of Achille Interactive, uh, which is now engaged in a, um, a, a, a an FDA approved trial, a pivotal trial, uh, using their software for behavioral health, I'll, and we'll ask him to talk about that. Um, next name is John. Uh, John Wang is a, a cardiologist uh, who, who uh, after being a practicing cardiologist uh, at, and, and, uh, uh, and running a cardiovascular clinic, um, went to, into business. He, he worked at McKinsey. Uh, he wor has worked at a you know, couple of uh, uh, notable healthcare companies, including Amgen, and now he's head of cardiovascular and metabolic uh, uh, innovation at Johnson & Johnson. Um, and, uh, and he's also uh, 
uh, the, the person who was uh, largely responsible for bringing Johnson & Johnson and Apple together to collaborate on the future of clinical development. Uh, and we'd love to hear a little bit more about that. And then at the end, uh, Dr. Plowman, Scooter Plowman, he's the medical director at Proteus Digital Health. Um, very interesting company that has uh, puts technology on a pill in order to help promote patient adherence. Um, Scooter is an impressive guy. Uh, in addition to his medical degree, he attended Oxford. He speaks multiple languages, uh, and he publishes frequently in this in this area on uh, use of digital technologies, um, and 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 also. Uh, Proteus in particular is, is not just tech, uh, innovative around technology and medicine, but also bringing that innovation to its business model. So we, we'd like to hear a little bit more about that. So um, what I'll ask is that each one of our speakers just uh, talk for a few minutes about, about their company and what uh, how they see kind of their, them uh, pushing the boundaries forward of uh, digital medicine and digital health. And then we'll have some questions and then we'll uh, ask the audience to also ask some questions. So let's start with Lynn. Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. So I'll talk a little bit about Talkspace, which is, as was mentioned, an online behavioral health therapy company. And it was really born out of a recognition of one of the broken parts of the healthcare system, of which you could argue there are many. Um, but behavioral health in particular, where there is such a high incidence of occurrence and a low incidence of people being able to access care. And having lived on the healthcare side of the equation before, I can tell you about the number of challenges we would hear directly from people who wanted to access care and couldn't. Uh, and they range anything from I can't find a provider to I can't go to a recurring appointment, which in behavioral health is uh, one of the key components to success. And so as the company was being formed, we looked at how do we take that face-to-face -face experience and turn it into a digital modality, um, recognizing that in behavioral health there actually is no physical contact that's required, also recognizing that um, people do feel a sense of stigma when they're entering into a therapist office and talking face to face with someone that they don't know, chances are the therapist was somewhat of a random selection unless they had a, uh, a referral from someone. And so we started looking at all these different barriers and thought, how do we use technology to help solve for those barriers? So how do we profile our therapist so we know that when a patient wants to access therapy, they know what their therapist specialty is. We also know what their outcomes are, which is something that was completely absent in behavioral health because everything happens in a traditional sense in a, in a verbal and therefore redacted way. So we started recognizing first that we could help people find providers, second that we could take the whole appointment uh, piece out of the equation because therapy doesn't necessarily have to be a set 50 minute prescribed set of time and could happen in a more ongoing way which may even be more beneficial than bucketing everything till your next two week appointment and also helping to erase the stigma piece of it. Uh, if I'm behind my screen and I'm sending messages to my therapist, she can't he or she can't necessarily see um, how I'm feeling when I'm sending it, and it really kind of helps take that uh, stigma effect away from it. We mentioned the promotions that we're doing with Michael Phelps, and it was really around that. It was around stigma. And you know, if Michael Phelps, one of the um, arguably greatest Olympians, at least in our time, um, could mention his battles with depression and mental health, then it kind of puts him on a level playing field that a lot of people struggle with mental health and it's okay to get help. So that's a long-winded way of talking about Talkspace and how we were founded. And uh, we have a lot of ground we plan to cover going forward, including psychiatry, as well as working with primary care doctors. But I'll turn it over. And, and, and you know, just to, to mention, uh, you know, Talkspace has really been terrific about pushing forward um, the, uh, uh, the ability to provide access to, to mental health. Um, and, uh, you know, to, to harness the, um, 
uh, the recognition of somebody like like Michael Phelps. Um, that's just the, soup, the the top layer. Um, they have conferences uh, where where they bring together leaders in in healthcare and practitioners in healthcare. Uh, they've had a number of of efforts to uh, uh, give away some of their services, particularly around teenagers mo mo most recently. Um, uh, and you know, it, it, it kind of fascinates me, the ability to both innovate on the technology as well as the business model to, to make the, these things work. So, um, all right, uh, Eddie, could uh, uh, tell sure. us a little bit more about Achille? Sure, happy to. Hi, everybody. Um, so again, Eddie Martucci, I'm uh, one of the co-founders and the CEO of Achille Interactive. Um, we're a prescription digital therapeutic company. And um, what that means is uh, that we're making software that we believe um, can and should be the medicine for certain patients and certain symptoms of disorders um, and can be prescribed. And so uh, we founded the company back at the end of um, 2011 um, with actually a very similar need premise um, that Lynn was talking about where uh, we're, we're seeing across mental health and neurology and behavioral health that some of the same problems that exist today essentially have existed for decades, where um, the main modality that's scalable to treat these conditions, and we're talking about everything from depression to pediatric behavioral disorders, anxiety, et cetera, um, are uh, medications. And uh, medications, in many cases, are um, either not fully effective or have side effects and at the very least are very poorly targeted for certain types of um, neurology. Um, and the only other option existing at, at that point is, as we talked about, um, behavioral um, intervention with therapists, which is not very scalable unless you innovate. Um, and so we actually ended up in a, in a slightly different place. We were really um, got excited and, and almost obsessed with the idea that one of the big needs that we saw in medicine for the future is cognitive function, or in many disorders, cognitive dysfunction. Uh, it's an area that is generally very poorly targeted by uh, molecular methods, um, mainly because cognition works at the functional circuit level, um, not necessarily, um, or we at least don't necessarily understand enough about the receptor-based pharmacology of how that works. And so across many of these disorders that I'm mentioning, um, one of the most prevalent issues, one of the biggest issues that is actually long-term determinant of quality of life, employment status, et cetera, is actually cognitive dysfunction. Um, so it's the types of symptoms that people sometimes don't recognize as readily um, until they're debilitating. Um, so we've actually brought forward um, software products that we've developed um, to be prescription software to directly treat cognitive dysfunction in a very safe way. Um, I've kind of avoided in that last minute and a half or two minutes, um, I guess one of our claim to fames or what people like to, like to point to us for. Um, we deliver our algorithms, our sensory stimulus to activate cognitive networks in action video games. And so our delivery vehicle, um, what patients have in their hands are actually fun, active video games. Um, and one of our core philosophies is we hope that with digital therapeutics broadly, and certainly with how we approach this industry, um, that we can go beyond just treating a disorder in a new way. We can go beyond prescription um, uh, treatments for a range of disorders to complement drugs. We can actually help patients rethink medicine in a new way. So we're very excited and we think there's a huge opportunity for when a patient is taking their medicine, if you put medicine, it's not in quotes, it really is medicine, uh, it just happens to not look like a pill, um, patients can actually not just tolerate their medicine, but maybe enjoy their medicine, maybe be delighted by the experience of medicine. Um, and those are phrases we tend to not hear together, um, but are very, very close to our heart. Um, so where we are today, um, we're uh, also a bit recognized for being a company that's raised a, a lot of money and have not yet released a product. Um, so uh, the reason for that is we built our company a lot more like a biotech company. So uh, our lead product is a treatment for um, inattention, specifically attention and cognitive def deficits in ADHD patients. Um, and we've had uh, now four trials culminating in a large nationwide um, 350 subject, first of its kind, um, pivotal trial um, that we're using as a full package uh, to bring to FDA. 
um, for a prescribable treatment for ADHD. Um, and then we have a whole portfolio of products based on that core technology and a number of other technologies across neurology and mental health that we hope in the next you know, two to five years, there's patients that are um, playing their medicine is one of the phrases we like to say. I'm happy to talk about anything else, but that's us. You know, and it's fascinating. It, it just the, the analogy of uh, uh, operating like a biotech company. I mean, it raises really some some fascinating questions around. Well, what is the active ingredient? Mm -hmm. How do you understand that active ingredient? But but you know, we'll come back to this. But but the uh, the other fascinating point is that you know, you, you, you defined it as a game. You know, this is the gamification of behavioral therapy. Um, but to really understand how that works, you have to understand how the, how the brain works. Yes. And so the scientific founder of Achille uh, is, is Adam Ghazali, who has a large neurobehavioral lab in, uh, in Stanford. Who, UCSF. Yep. Uh, UCSF, sorry. Um, I get all those California places mixed up. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but looking very specifically at brain changes that, 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 that are happening through sort of repetitive study, these, these, these repetitive uh, uh, activities. All right, let's shift over. And uh, uh, John, uh, could you uh, tell us a little bit more about what you're doing and, and kind of your, your, your vision for the future uh, on some of the things you're working on? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Greg. So um, I'm part of J&J, &J, and J&J &J is the largest healthcare company in the world. And it, it basically has a mission to change the trajectory of human health. Um, pretty modest mission <laughs> statement, but that's our objective. Uh, we have three opcos. One's consumer, one's med device, the other one's pharmaceuticals. I'm in the pharma division. And oh, I thought I was it may not be working here. It should be. How's this? Yep, that's better. <laughs> there we go. Thanks. Um, so we're, I'm in the pharma division within J&J, &J, and what we're trying to do vis-a-vis -vis at least digital is really in, in two realms. One is around therapeutics, which is sort of treating known disease. And there's this other effort internally that we're trying to sort of understand in its um, titled World Without Disease. So it's more, it's more aspirational than just prevention. It's really where we believe that, that you can actually get in front of the actual problem more so than, than through identifying known diseases, but actually even preventing uh, the unknown diseases. So uh, as it relates to digital, on the therapeutic side, what we're trying to do, and this was part of the Apple J&J &J collaboration, was saw the need to change the way that we bring products to market. So as you know, products are incredibly expensive to, to uh, get approved. We, they take a long time. We wanted to shorten and cheapen that process. There's a lot of reasons in terms of price pressure and also just that the competition is, um, is getting faster. The other part um, relates to understanding how digital is going to affect the marketplace. So we operate in a market. What is digital going to do to the marketplace? And so one of the things that we wanted to understand was if we deployed digital in a real world type setting, how is that going to change the patient journey and the patient experience? So we did the study before, um, it was called M-STOPS. It was in conjunction with Scripps and the NIH and Aetna. And what we did was we patched people with this ECG patch to see if they had atrial fibrillation. And uh, the, the so what of it was that, yeah, we detected more AFib, that's fine, but we actually changed the patient journey where there was a fourfold reduction in people who went to the ER and there was a significant increase in the people who went to cardiologist's office at the first point of contact and entry into the health system. So you're changing the value, you're, you're changing the patient journey, which means that you're actually changing the value chain. And we needed to understand what that looked like. And so as part of, and part of my pitch internally to, to get them to, buy, to sign off on the Apple J&J collaboration was, we need to understand what that new value chain looks like if we're gonna be successful in the new world. So um, I'll just leave it at that in terms of the high level sort of points of view and ways that we're trying to understand how digital is going to affect how we operate. Well, and, and um, if, if you didn't hear it at the, at the very beginning, um, John said that their goal is to change healthcare, which, you know, you would think might be a little bit ambitious, but then when you realize that um, he, he represents the largest healthcare company in the world, 
and they've created a partnership with uh, the most, I don't know if it still is, the most valuable company in the world, Apple. Um, and how you got this, the two of them to sit down and shake hands over this, you know, I suppose is, a, is, is, is another longer discussion, maybe an entire symposium on itself, uh, about itself. Um, and, you know, in answer to the question, is it working, um, anybody who's tried to run a clinical trial knows how difficult it is to get patient enrollment. The average rate of enrollment is about half a patient per site per month, which means that many sites don't enroll any patients. You'll get a few patients over, over the course of a year whereas the Apple Heart study enrolled over 400,000 patients in something like eight, eight months. So uh, really, uh, it, it, it's a, a success on an order of magnitude that, that our clinical development industry can only dream about. So, so uh, I think the ambitions are well placed and, and, and the expectations uh, are, are, are accurate. Well. So now speaking of, uh, of, of someone who has experience uh, navigating a partnership between a small company and a large company, um, well, Scooter, let, let, me, let me give you the, uh, uh, give you the mic. Uh, and, and the reason I mention that is that uh, Proteus has had a successful partnership with Otsuka. Uh, so one of the youngest companies in the world with one of the oldest companies in the world. Uh, and you know, we, we, we'd love to hear a little bit about that too, as well as a little bit more about Proteus. Sure, yeah, thanks. Is this one working? Okay, great. Um, yeah, honor, honored to be here. I, I, I'm, uh, Feel like I uh, don't deserve to be at this this table. Actually, this is pretty this is pretty awesome. I, I've been at Proteus about two and a half years. Proteus has been around actually since 2001, uh, and we're a digital medicines company, and we make medicines digital. Uh, and we actually were founded on sort of uh, the principle of of identifying three gaps that were perceived in healthcare, um, and how they might be answered with sort of a single or simple question. Uh, the gaps being that medicines aren't working in the real world like we might anticipate or hope they would see that they work in, in clinical trials, uh, that patients aren't taking their medicines as, as we wished or hoped that they might, uh, knowing from decades of, of uh, literature, reviews, and uh, real-world studies that about 50 percent of people take their medicines uh, as prescribed, of course varying somewhat but not dramatically um, by disease state or acuity, uh, and, and that medications are becoming increasingly more expensive and less affordable um, in, in an era where we're trying to pay for value. And the simple question then being, did my patient take their medicine and when? Um, and actually a fundamentally belief that if 50% of people aren't taking their medicines, uh, then we can't be blaming the patient. Uh, in any other industry other than healthcare, when 50% of the end users are failing or struggling to, to achieve the end goal, we would never blame the end user, we'd fix the product. Uh, and that was sort of fundamentally at the core of what we thought we'd do together uh, as, as a company and as uh, many companies that coming together because now as a device company as well as a pharmaceutical company and, and then software and, and healthcare delivery, um, we've brought together a lot of industries to develop medicines that talk to your smartphone. Um, and we've done this through a very tiny ingestible sensor. It's the size of a grain of sand. In fact, we uh, we put them here in, in our business card, um, and it's uh, literally made of dietary minerals, copper, magnesium, and, and a little bit of silicon, uh, in very, very trace quantities. Uh, and it's powered by the body. It's, uh, it's turned on when it's swallowed, and then it passes right through you. Um, and during that brief time, it's enabled to transmit data about the medication, what medication it was, what time it was taken, to the individual pill and, and dose, um, paired with, with wearable technology that uh, is in a band-aid form factor that patients are you know, able to measure their step count, their rest activity level, uh, and heart rate and other metrics. Uh, these together then create a, a data set that enables really observational care in the ambulatory setting. As physicians, we're both artists and scientists, um, and, and in our efforts to be scientists, we rely on observation, and yet the vast majority of care in this world is delivered outside of observation in the ambulatory world where uh, we actually don't know how our patients are, are behaving or performing. And most patients actually want to be known by their provider. They don't go to the physician to withhold information, typically. Um, and we've, that's one of the things that I've been overwhelmed with at, at Proteus is, is how willing patients are to share this data within the confines of a HIPAA-compliant and secure uh, system that, of course, uh, is at table stakes for us. 
Um, but, and I'll finish by just saying what's, what's fascinating is once we know exactly what medicine is being taken and when, to the, to the minute, if we needed to know that, not only do we now enable a, a clinical trial or a, a CRO workplace and, and real-world evidence, phase four evidence um, environment uh, in every patient, um, potentially, but we also enable value-based arrangements, and we have actually a value-based contract in place today um, that uh, as soon as you know when a med is being taken and that it's being taken on label, we can now start to price medications based on their outcome. Uh, and we have, I can talk more about this uh, as well, but this gets us to then our, our OTSICA relationship, which again, I think I'll save for, for maybe uh, our, our next uh, phase of discussion, but it's an awesome opportunity for us to now take challenging mental health medications that as we pointed out, one of the biggest challenges is they have bad side effects. They're often not taken well, and they, they often don't work like we want them to. How do we then put an outcomes-based arrangement in place to at least price them to the outcome we want to achieve? Terrific, terrific. Um, the, you know, I, I mentioned at the beginning, it's the, the, the evidence being, let's build on evidence, uh, and, and let, let's move with that. And, and the evidence generated by, by Proteus is, is really uh, not just positive, but it's surprising. Um, how, uh, how knowing how difficult it is to, to affect adherence, and then, and then seeing that you can take patients who've been labeled as medically refractory, not behaviorally refractory, but medically refractory, and actually demonstrate a positive outcome based, based on, on medication adherence. Um, but I, I want to dive a little bit deeper into this idea of generating evidence in a more traditional sense. And, and Eddie, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump back to you. Um, you're running a pivotal clinical trial, an FDA-approved clinical trial. Um, tell us a little bit more about that, particularly around uh, what endpoints had to be developed for this uh, and, and how that interaction with the, the, you know, the usual suspects, the FDA, uh, 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 P the PIs, the principal investigators, et cetera, sure. around the development of novel endpoints. Sure, sure. Um, just a little bit of innovation when you're trying to put a video game into a trial. Um, so we, ha we had a lot of fun with that. Um, we, I think starting at sort of a basic level, um, we brought forward a, a thesis to, to build this company that um, if we were going to do so, um, we couldn't just say clinical trials are too hard. And actually, that's just a story in people's heads, right? Clinical trials are either always hard or always easy, but they're always something. It doesn't really matter the thing that you're putting in. It just means you have to innovate a little bit or, or um, come up with some creative ideas. So uh, there are, you know, our, our trial that Greg's mentioning is 20 sites, over 350 children nationwide. I mean, it's at the same scale and scope of pivotal trials for drugs in, in mental health and specifically in ADHD. Actually, we used about two-thirds of our sites are the sort of same top recruiting sites for all the ADHD registration trials. So they know how to run those trials. Lots of innovation here. Um, one, there's logistics around getting, um, you know, a, a tablet or, or a smartphone into someone's hands. Um, there's logistics in terms of the data. So one thing that's really interesting, Scooter was talking about, when you ingest a pill that has a sensor, you get data. On our treatment, which is used on, a, uh, on a, an iPad or similar device, you also get real-time data in terms of use, compliance, and, and even progress. We didn't want to ignore that, so we had to build in some protocols so that staff at centers who are not used to looking at any data until the end of the study can somehow look at the data without being influenced um, because we think it's important to the treatment. Um, and we have blinding and control issues. So what you've seen a lot in... Uh, in digital health, well, I guess the first thing you've seen a lot is, by and large, there are not large prospective trials run. Most people are not doing so. And if they are, they're not well controlled. We said we want to set the highest possible bar. And so uh, we, we built a control, which was actually an educational video game with all the same reward timing loops um, as, uh, as our treatment. And then we even went further um, and blinded the participants and the clinicians in such a way that we were uh, testing two potentially effective interventions. So actually even a different blinding hypothesis. So for us clinical trial wonks, um, that's super exciting for the rest of us. You're like, what in the world? This is, this is really not fodder for a panel. Um, I like it. So what we ended up doing was uh, implementing all these systems to properly blind everyone. Um, but, uh, and, and that was very innovative. Um, we have, uh, 
but, but it can be done. I guess that's, that's kind of the point. And so we sat with FDA a couple of years ago. We had multiple meetings with FDA where we proposed, we went back and forth, and we actually worked with them. They've been incredible to work with to date. Um, and, uh, and I think very collaborative. And, and, you know, people were telling us, don't go to FDA because they're going to change your paradigm. And we said, no, we want, we want to work with FDA. And it was great. It was actually great. We designed a really great trial together. Um, so that's kind of on the, on the design side. Um, in terms of outcome measure, I think it's really important. I mean, we, uh, what I'm going to say is going to sound like it's coming out of two sides of our mouth. So one more general philosophy, I don't think we should be um, trying to bring things in to clinical trials at this stage that are um, different or disparate from accepted known clinical endpoints. I think um, we want to be showing that this actually works. At the same time, sometimes digital treatments um, can target things differently. So in our case, we're targeting cognition. It turns out there are no approved treatments on the drug or device side that directly target cognitive function. So we necessarily had to um, uh, not invent outcome measures, but use outcome measures that maybe aren't the most accepted standard as primary. So what we did is we took um, standard outcome measures that are used for kind of looking at the totality of the disorder. We put them as secondary endpoints. We measure them in the exact same way as drug trials. Um, and uh, as a primary outcome measure, we looked at something that's accepted and known as a measure of cognitive function. So what, what I don't think should be done is changing the accepted and known part. Um, you can innovate, uh, you can only innovate so many things, and I, I generally don't recommend innovating um, uh, an outcome measure for a pivotal trial. I absolutely recommend using digital to get better and better outcome measures over time, but those, of course, have to be validated. Mm -hmm. So that was a little bit of a rambling. I don't know if that answered the question. No, no, it, 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 it's fascinating. And, well, it, and it's interesting, the hurdles that, that you face doing, um, uh, it's a novel intervention but it's a standard clinical trial design. You know, whereas John, you know, you're, you're uh, uh, we're talking about, you know, the, it's called various things, mobile clinical trials, decentralized clinical trials, virtual clinical trials, but it promises to be better, faster, cheaper, you know, reaching a broader audience. My, my question is, what are, the, what are the hurdles? I mean, it, it sounds so good. Why isn't everybody doing this? You know, what, what, and, and, you know why, why are you first in line? Yeah, I don't know why, actually. Um, they probably should. I think it's um, around, I think there's a lot of inertia that companies to do this. There's a lot of fear, as I found, there are a lot of internal dynamics that sort of prevent innovation. I think that's sort of what innovation is, is getting over the fear, getting over the inertia. It's almost the counter definition of it. Um, but I think certainly the technology has enabled it. There's sort of also a sort of market awareness now that this can be done. I think that people have seen examples where you have, um, you know, maybe 500 patient um, studies, uh, a sample size of 500, and it can sort of be encapsulated within a few sites and, and that's it. And so those can uh, largely be done virtually. When what, because in the cardiovascular space we tend to run 15,000, 20,000, 27,000 patient studies, uh, we thought what we, we need to do is we need to scale it in a way that sort of broadens the patient profiles. So one of the criticisms of RCTs is that it's highly selected populations because, of course, you want to get the treatment effect size, et cetera, et cetera. All good, all reasonable, given sort of where we are, but we wanted to sort of address that and say, what does the therapeutic actually look like, or what is the diagnostic in this case for the Apple Watch? What does it actually look like in the real world with a very broad population so that you really can get a sense of what it's going to do in the real world, um, but yet using an RCT-type design to sort of bring people in? So the the uh, if that's your goal, then going broad and wide sort of forces you to become more decentralized and using virtual channels. And, you know, now people are uh, carrying these uh, phones everywhere. Um, it, by the time baby boomers are sort of, well, the current sort of generation becomes baby boomers, current generation meaning those in the 40s and 50s, become baby boomers. I mean, there's going to be incredible penetration of that kind of technology. So we wanted to be ahead of the curve, to see what that looked like. Um, the, I think the challenges are probably more internal. I think the FDA is very willing to, to Eddie's point. They're really, really excited. They used to, I think they have a bad rap. They, they used to be really sort of not cooperative. They've changed um, quite a bit in many ways. So that combined with the penetration technology, combined with sort of like market needs, combined with, you know, just a, just a recognition that FANG, those companies, 
are just so valuable that they've got to have something that maybe life sciences should look to, uh, with sort of a recognition that we should probably go this way and leverage the abilities that they sort of give us. Yeah. If, if I can just follow on, I mean, from a different perspective, we're slightly smaller than J&J, &J, it turns <laughs> out. Um, so one of the reasons we, so we actually also run pilot uh, remote trials, and I'm a huge supporter of, for all the reasons John said, I 100% agree. Um, I think sometimes companies want to jump to that, right, without any, I won't even call it ground truth. I actually believe that the remote measurement and remote validation is the ground truth, because that's what happens in the real world. But... Um, going directly to that sort of without any type of correlation or without any type of at least knowledge of what happens in a, a sort of standard, mort standard bricks and mortar study where we do have reference data on, you know, in cardiology. I think that's an important thing for small companies too, is to, um, you know, if you're, if you're going to innovate on areas, show that, okay, we're innovating, maybe it's better, maybe it's worse, maybe it's comparable or different, but we at least have data sets from a couple different sources, including the standard. Um, I personally, I think that's a way to go. It's also as a company looking looking for, um, you know, kind of acceptance and adoption in a medical world, which is becoming more and more fragmented, having multiple lines of credibility is, um, is critical as well. And so I think, you know, J&J &J and others would support, um, you know, it's not, it's not about, maybe it's about in a few-year time frame throwing out the standard trials, which I might be supportive of because there's so many flaws. Um, but really today, it's about showing those can be as good or better in many different ways, um, but not immediately jumping to that and kind of closing our eyes and ears on what happens on standard trials. As well. so, so, Eddie, at some point, Achille had the choice of are we, gonna, are we going to go the FDA route or the non-FDA route? Maybe give us a little bit of a, of a highlight how that decision was made. Um, pretty easy decision, so, um, it, which sounds like the opposite. Usually the pretty easy decision is put something out on the consumer market and, and see what happens with you know, low dollars. Um, for us, uh, we, we care deeply about making sure that if we're going to build a business, it has to be a real treatment that dramatically helps people. And if we're going to build a real treatment that dramatically helps people, we better make sure it gets to the people who need it. Um, and we were a bit concerned in the general dominated healthcare world of, of software, especially in our field where um, uh, it, we're talking about the brain. This tends to be one of the highest preyed upon areas in um, crappy software. You can all pull up your app stores right now and search brain or ADHD or depression or anxiety. Um, we felt that it was really important for uh, doctors, essentially, to, to have the ability to be part of this process by being able to prescribe it and understand the data flow and the FDA approval, for patients to actually understand um, uh, that this is legitimate. Um, because your average patient on the street, where, who I have a ton of respect for, uh, your average parent of a child with ADHD is not able to or, or has the time or whatever to scrutinize all these things that are on the app store. So from our perspective, what we've seen is that people who really need help, um, and here we're removing the kind of stigma issue because that's, that is actually a very separate issue in terms of access. Um, people who really need help many times um, it's not by sort of scouring, you know, the internet and consumer. It's by showing up at a doctor's office and having both the doctor and the patient come to an agreement that this is a really good, valid solution. So that's really what drove it for us. It's not to say that there aren't innovative com uh, consumer models that can get to that same level of credibility and acceptance, but we felt it was actually an easy trade-off with the understanding that it would take a lot more money, a lot more time, and a lot more risk, um, but we're willing to undertake that. Yeah, very interesting. Uh I'd like to shift back to, uh, to Lynn, kind of uh, uh, building on this discussion uh, uh, of uh, bringing treatments that work to people, um, yet uh, Talkspace didn't necessarily have to do clinical trials. Um, however, uh, I'm sure there were adoption barriers, hurdles to get through in the past and continually, and, and that will go forward. Um, and before before I, I let you answer, I just invite people, uh, if you have questions, please start approaching the mics, and, and as soon as you know, we have questions from the audience, we'll turn to them. Uh, until then, we'll just you know, keep the discussion going. But anyway, so, so back to you, Lynn. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about the, the adoption hurdles that, that, that you faced and, and what you see going forward. Sure, so I would say the, the 
topic of clinical studies and adoption hurdles actually go hand in hand. So in the behavioral health space, there's a number of different stakeholders. There's certainly the patient, there's the providers, and there's the health systems. And um, so first and foremost, we had an alternative way of delivering care that raised a lot of eyebrows. How can you text message your therapist and really call it therapy? And that's where having clinical studies uh, that actually demonstrated the efficacy of the product were really worth their weight in gold. And so we had partnered with some universities in terms of being able to track outcomes. And so, again, being able to demonstrate the clinical impact as well as also reminding folks that there was very little clinical evidence in a traditional face-to-face -face setting. And so we suddenly started opening eyes that we have evidence, it's really good, and you probably don't have evidence elsewhere, uh, kind of rang a few bells. I think the other approach specifically with Talkspace and thinking about those different stakeholders is that our mission was never to eradicate the traditional care models. We fully recognized and appreciated that those were appropriate for some people, maybe for many people. But we also recognized, as I said, that there's a huge piece of the population that wasn't able to access care. And so our goal was targeting those people who couldn't access care for a variety of different reasons. And so, you know, from the consumer side, it's a self-selection approach, right? They're either going to adopt to a digital approach in behavioral health, or they realize it's not for them, and that's okay. I would say the same is true on the provider side. We have some um, folks who recognize the value, the efficiency, as well as the clinical quality that they can deliver on the platform because of the tools that we provide to our therapists on the platform. But for some, it just does not feel like the right approach in traditional face-to-face is where they want to stay. Interestingly, um, and I say interestingly from having lived in the payer side of the world for um, several, many years of my career, um, and they are typically seen as more of the ones that put up barriers, uh, the payers were actually one of our fastest adopters when we entered the enterprise space. Now, granted, we had a lot of validity from being in the consumer markets, but the payer world, uh, they are hearing every single day from their major customers, which are the big employers, that our employees cannot access behavioral care. You don't have enough providers. You don't have providers in the right place. And it's a pretty finite pie when you talk to health plans about trying to grow their network. And so the, a digital solution like this comes along and it, again, becomes almost a bit of a non-brainer. I'm not gonna say anything is easy, but it was easier than I thought it would be, which again underscores that the solution has validity and it wasn't meant to be an eradication of another way of accessing care, but really a supplement and opening up different channels to care. I mean, one of the things that still fascinates me when I hear people, um, when I hear you talk to uh, people in your company talking to people, there's, there's typically a, uh, uh, invariably there'll be a physician who says, hmm, yeah, yeah, I, I guess that's okay. I, I, guess, I guess I could use that. When, when you look at the numbers, depending on what you include in behavioral health and mental health, it's somewhere between 15 million and 100 million people affected in the United States, and there's some, somewhere between 10,000 and maybe 30,000 behavioral health workers. So the question of access is just amazingly um, uh, uneven here. Uh, and so I guess maybe the, you know, to make my comment in the form of a question, um, are you, do you feel like you're opening sort of new channels? Is it to different patients, incremental patients, uh, you know, or in business terms, incremental markets, uh, or, or is it still, you know, pro the same sort of provider based? Yeah, so with the providers, um, I would say it's, we've really attracted a talent pool of folks who recognize that. Um, the flexibility that the platform allows for them and not having to be in a set place at a set time and having no shows and scheduling appointments um, has really opened up. I would say provider recruiting has also been one of the 
easier uh, hurdles we've crossed. Again, not, not thinking that that would necessarily be the case. Um, we write, again, they are able to see more patients more efficiently and get paid from it, do it from their couch or wherever they may be. Um, again, there are still providers who can't adopt to the digital framework, and that may be okay. Um, we do, again, go back to our clinical outcomes and our clinical studies where we can show symptom reduction as fast as or as good as face-to-face, -face, um, often better, but we don't put ourselves out as we are better. We put ourselves out as an option. In terms of the user base, what we have found is that about 60 to 70 percent of people who come on to Talkspace and use the platform have not been able to access therapy elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So it really demonstrates opening up the doors and getting more people into care that can be very beneficial, not only for their emotional well-being, but of course for their total medical cost and well-being. We also track for people who have been in therapy before. Do you prefer doing Talkspace or do you prefer face-to-face? -face? Now, they may be somewhat biased because they're using Talkspace, but it was about 90% or so who said the convenience uh, far outweighs face-to-face. -face. I can message seven days a week. I'm not having to wait for a scheduled appointment. Uh, and I was actually able to develop a really strong bond with my therapist, which is something that we know is very critical to a successful outcome in therapy. And as I mentioned early on about the way that people pick therapists in a traditional face-to-face -face setting, it's very random. And here we've been able to put some science and some algorithms around our therapist and who do we think they will best fit in terms of our user base. You know, I mean, so many wonderful surprises, you know, develop a stronger bond with your therapist in the, in the digital space. So uh, we have a question. Hi, I have a question from the patient consumer perspective. So it's a, also an access question, but who is going to pay for these <laughs> new therapeutics as well as things like adherence in a lot of cases is because people can't afford their medicines, you know, from a patient support perspective, so. Show me, show me the money. Yeah, um, I, can, I can start with that. And there's, there's several models um, that, um, that have been used, but as I mentioned, we we've, have value-based contracts in the marketplace today. So um, one of those I can talk about, it, it's public and, and we, have a, we have a press release on it back in August, but this was with a, a capitated provider group in Desert, Desert Oasis in, in Palm Springs. They have about 80,000 senior lives um, the average age in our study with them right now is 72. Um, we've had really rapid enrollment, um, almost 150 patients just in, in the last uh, several weeks. Um, and it, but the beauty of it is that they are paying us um, and our, our fees and services only when patients are 80% adherent, um, and only then we get a bonus payment when they come under control. Um, so it's an interesting way for them, of course. They, every bed day is an adverse event. Um, and they're a capitated group that um, subsists on managing care uh, and managing those finances. And so I think starting um, with pay providers, uh, of which there are now many in our, in our country, uh, employers actually are, are also an interesting, uh, I think, uh, route into the payer marketplace. Um, but starting with especially pay providers where they care very much about the outcomes, both financial and clinical, um, is a great way to, to prove it when you can put your money, uh, I think, kind of where your mouth is on outcomes. Other comments about payer models? Yeah, I think, I think you're going to see a lot of payer models develop, especially if we think about digital therapeutics broadly. There's a lot of sort of different types emerging. Um, today, you've, even in this sort of nascent industry that we're in, um, and you can look up the Digital Therapeutic Alliance if you want, which is kind of the first industry group that really um, is consolidating and advocating and educating on this front, so you can see the types of companies involved. Um, there's already a few different types of pay models evolving, right? There's, you have different um, uh, sort of value-based pricing models. Um, you have potentially uh, drug pricing models, NDC codes, even though these things are pieces of software in many cases. Um, you have medical device, uh, or rather medical benefits and even DMEs that you're seeing start to emerge. Um, and I think it really goes to the philosophy that if you are injecting a, just a new treatment modality for patients and doctors that care for patients, um, 
just like anything else, there are going to be different plug-and-play ways that those are used. And the one we haven't mentioned is there will still be some consumer pay models where um, consumers are, you know, you can either say on the negative side bearing the burden or on the positive side um, exerting choice <laughs> to, to pay. So I think all of the above actually exist in a way, and it's, it's one of my favorite things thinking about the emergence of this new type of industry here using technology. There is a single way, and one of the earlier panels talked about it, the black box way by which pills today are covered, and it has evolved into a very um, inefficient and uh, negative system. Um, I think we're at this precipice where there's a lot of potential ways that this could go, and I think it would be best for the industry to keep all of them open. I'd love to see a company doing every one of those ways I mentioned to keep all of those optionalities open and keep it more um, kind of flexible for patients. I mean, innovation doesn't stop uh, in the laboratory. It doesn't stop when you get the product approved. Uh, it, it continues, and, and you know, it, it, it sort of leads me to, to wonder, um, are, you, are you approaching this with a different mindset, knowing that you have to be different and create more innovative pricing models? Because it's not a pill. It's not a standard. Um, uh, to kind of continue that cycle of innovation to increase adoption and, and, and use the products. Yeah, we certainly are. I mean, we're, we're building to the point as we approach launch that is um, that actually enables multiple of those options. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the point being we're not going to be deterministic or paternalistic, which are two very big problems in today's medicine world, I believe. Um, we're going to build optionality. That takes a little bit more work, um, but I think it's really, really important to enable access as quickly as possible, and flexible access is going to be a good thing for the system, not a bad. Another question? Um, yes, thank you. This is a question for Lynn. Um, uh, Lynn, what's it going to take uh, for um, Medicaid and Medicare to cover um, a service or product like yours? Um, both at your end, what's it going to take? And where, uh, if one were to nudge the government, uh, where would you start? Sure. So I, I think I heard your question correctly, which was around where does Medicare, Medicaid fit in the space and the government's impact? Was that right? Yes. And what's it, what's it going to take to move, to move the ball? Yes. I wish I knew that magical answer uh, in terms of what it's going to take to move them. Uh, we do see progress coming along in general with the telehealth laws. Um, what's been, I think, a little bit interesting is that the federal government from a VA perspective is a little bit ahead of where the other agencies are. Um, Medicaid, for me, is a very interesting market. I think it's one that we could have a very immediate and tangible impact in, um, but yet we are currently held up by the laws. Um, for example, in New York State, where we've really spent some time looking at what, those, what the legislation looks like and we're waiting for it to be enacted so that we can um, actually bring this out to their Medicaid population. And of course, Medicaid is a state-by-state -state endeavor. Medicare um, also, I think, moving in the right direction in terms of allowing alternate forms of treatment and being a little bit less restrictive, um, obviously pretty restrictive beforehand in terms of it had to be in a certain geography where there wasn't enough access to care and you had to meet certain standards. Um, so we hope to see all of that loosening up in, a, in the um, spirit of opening up access to care for both of those populations. Uh, follow up to, uh, to Scooter or? or? Um, I wonder if other speakers have a. Have yeah, a, well, you know, I think there's idea. been a strong, there has been a strong signal um, as recently as January of this year um, with the RPM um, remote, remote patient monitoring codes, for instance. So CMS took a, took a stand, which is, I think, a very positive one. And, you know, there's been some pushback, I think, by the industry that, oh, you know, but co-pays are still required and, it, you know, they didn't go far enough. But I think it was a definitive um, stance, actually, in, in favor of remote patient monitoring technologies that can now be reimbursed for in a fee-for-service environment. And then more, even more recently with a press release by 
uh, CMS that these could now be used in a Medicare Advantage context. And so I think it's, these are strong, um, strong signals for us, and, and we know the value-based um, movement seems to be, at least in the current administration, a strong priority. And so, um, you know, mirroring those two, I think, is, is, is moving us all in the right direction. And then, you know, taking advantage of CMMI is always a great opportunity. I think they're, they have, in some cases, more, more money than they can play with, um, actually, that it is, it is in perpetuity. Uh, the CMMI grant that, that was uh, brought in through the ACA is, um, is money that I don't know in any partisan environment will, will go away, um, given the way that it's been funded. And so that, that's an opportunity I think will continue to last for people to develop novel pay, uh, you know, payment models. Is anyone aware of any lobby uh, working on this at all? Any names, any... <laughs> It, 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 are you lobbyists? So, so actually, um, uh, although although I, I don't think they'd call themselves a lobbying group, there are uh, uh, similarly we see we see innovation happening kind of at the social level almost in the adoption of, of these digital therapeutics. So uh, there is the Digital Therapeutic Alliance, and the executive director is here today. There's a new organization called the Digital Medicine Society, uh, which is going to be announced in, in the next couple of months. So there, uh, you know, to use that phrase, it takes a village. I mean, it takes, uh, uh, this has to be a multidisciplinary approach that brings policymakers along with clinicians, along with innovators together in order to, to push some of these forward. And, and it's, it's also equally fascinating to see at that uh, trade group level, advocacy group level, uh, those, those people are coming together as well. Yeah, one of, one of the specific examples along with the DTA um, is a group called Advamed, which works in the medical device space, and they've sort of started to um, uh, to work on this concept, but with an eye toward the future of medical device innovation, which includes digital technologies, of course. Um, so that's an area that um, I think you're seeing a lot of work in um, that hopefully will lead to something. But I think it's a, it's almost like a, um, a groundswell effort. Like at some point, these, the little holes in the, in the levy eventually lead to something very big. Um, and it's hard to predict exactly which initiative is going to punch through first. Um, but I, I totally agree with Scooter. I mean, I think some of, the, some of what you're seeing in different niches of healthcare industry are really promising, and I think we'll get there. Um, but those are some of the groups that are, that are working on it right now. Thank you. So, so um, in order to get these things done, you know, we talked about uh, changing healthcare, you know, in, a, in many different ways. Incredibly promising, um, but we, we uh, uh, sort of building on this idea that, that we need organizations, we need to bring, you know, m multiple parties together, um, and each one of you has, has either partnered or interacted with, worked with large organizations. And, you know, let's keep this on the positive side, because we know how difficult it is. But there's something about uh, what your value propositions have been that got their attention. And, and you know, Scooter, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll bring it back. Let's start with you. Uh, again, you know, uh, Proteus Atsuka, not exactly who you would have thought would be kind of the ideal, you know, the, the expected combination, yet somehow you pulled it off. It's, it's, it's been a terrific relationship, um, and it's fascinating. You know, you mentioned it's a, com it's a company with 100-year business plans, meeting a company with, you know, <laughs> three to three months, nine months funding cycles. And it's been, it's been a terrific opportunity for us actually to both innovate quickly, um, but um, leverage each other's strengths. And so, you know, for instance, um, we have our own manufacturing facility in Hayward, California, where we're making these, uh, these essentially very, very tiny integrated circuits in a semiconductor technology. Um, it enables us to go um, very fast and very cheap at scale. Uh, but that meets a roll-to-roll -roll pharmaceutical manufacturing process that actually became really seamlessly integrated um, from a manufacturing perspective. But then, at the same time, from a commercial distribution perspective, we didn't, didn't begin to have a workforce that could have enabled um, distribution or education in the marketplace. Um, and leveraging then their assets with ours has, has been a, a terrific opportunity. And then, you know, there's all the, the sort of fun intricacies of working, uh, you know, <laughs> across great distances and languages um, that have actually turned into, some, there's some really great stories I couldn't go into, but even just 
errors in translation that have turned into innovative opportunities. And, you know, there's been a, a lot of really fun things, that I think, working with companies of different sizes that, you know, we butt heads all the time, but in, at the same moment, we're, we're having a great uh, operational success, and they've been a terrific partner. So. So tell us, what do you put in a hundred-year business plan? <laughs> <laughs> they're they're uh, broad visions for sure, uh, but it's uh, it's you know it's around. They're very committed to to mental health uh, and and have been um, and uh, I think are making a, an even stronger stance um, uh, internally and, and have many more drugs with us uh, that are already planned and in, 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 in the process. And so I think uh, for them, it's it's more about. Um, where do we um, where do we move uh, a population of patients to uh, in, in an environment that we cannot anticipate? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think you know, coming off of Walter's uh, talk, I I don't even know what the future is anymore. So uh, you know, it's, it's it's interesting. John, how did you get these giants to shake hands? Not easily. Um, the I, I think I was trying to approach it more from a fact-based point of view. Is just like, okay, guys, look at what's going on in the market. You've got um, digital making a penetration, and you can't stop it. Like, there's no way that you're going to sort of hold that back. Um, pricing is a, an issue, so you've got to bring down the cost by which you develop your products, and you need to increase your cycle time because you know it, it takes what five to seven years, and then you got a patent life of whatever. And it's like that doesn't work in today's world so much because, for example, in the digital area, I don't know what it's like for you or for you, but or, or for you, but for us, it's you know, it's it's too long, really. Um, whereas in the digital area, from what I can see, it can be as short as 18 months that you can get a, re- a dot release or you can get some changes. So I said, if we're going to sort of be where the puck we think is going to be, and I sort of painted that picture. I said, okay, that was internally there, and then. Really, Apple had their own vision. It wasn't aligned with ours initially, um, but sort of brought them to sort of, because they're new to healthcare, they don't really know the dynamics. So they can hire people in, but unless you have sort of the DNA of operating in the healthcare environment, you don't really know the issues you're going to face in implementation. Uh, so I had to sort of walk them off their, their storyline to sort of get us in line uh, together. And, and that was sort of, I think, the nut of it, um, and persistence. Mm-hmm. Probably more than anything else. Just uh, there were so many times when this thing was going to go dead. Mm-hmm. I know, um, but you just pick it back up and you try again. So I would just recommend that that for innovation. I think that's always a key part. Eddie. Um, oof. Yes. We, so we've done a couple partnerships. We've done an R and D partnership with Pfizer um, and Alzheimer's, which was exciting from a monitoring perspective. Um, we just announced that we did a really innovative partnership with. Um, a uh, company not as well known here in the U.S., but called Shianogi. Uh, so it's a big pharmaceutical company in Japan um, that uh, similarly has 100-year business plans and, <laughs> and similar things. Um, and s- extremely innovative partnership where um, we're sort of co-owning the commercial model. So we're building the entire commercial hub system that supports our products and um, uh, Shinogi is building up the sort of sales force and medical affairs to be able to launch products in Japan. Um, I think there it's, I think this is not just true of digital here. Anyone who's been in business development is true. Deals always almost fall apart a hundred times, right? As, as John was just saying. Um, and I think when they don't fall apart, it's because there's some shared vision that is too powerful um, to let it. And sometimes they still fall apart, but that's the thing that pulls it through. So in this case, you know, in both of our instances, um, working with larger companies, um, you know, we kind of kept the drumbeat of, um, of we are doing this no matter what. Sometimes small companies, you know, kind of feel like they're in a subjugated position to a big company. But I think if you believe in your vision enough and say, we're going to do this, and this is much better for everyone, including patients, if we do this together, it sounds really kind of handholdy and, and, um, and silly and cliche, but it's not. It's powerful. And that's the type of thing. That's why most people in healthcare come to work every day, right, um, is to help people. So I think keeping that vision uh, is the thing that got us through a lot of these deals. And then then you start to think creatively. You start to think, all right, what's our end goal here? Mm-hmm. It's to get it to the patient. Do either of us, big or small, know how to get that done exactly today? No, we don't, let's be honest. And then you start to get into a little bit more of a problem-solving framework, which is how we've, uh, how we've approached our partnerships. So, so, so Lynn, how did you get those contracts? I mean, was it the kumbayas and the hand-holding, or was it just, hey, we're going to save you money? 
Yeah, it was actually a little less about money. I think there was a couple things that impacted. First, you mentioned in the very beginning in your opening remarks about a consumer business or an enterprise business, and I would say the benefit that we had is being in the consumer business first gave us first the data to demonstrate the outcomes, which were very powerful, but also demonstrated that an individual consumer was willing to pay out of pocket to access care, and that's how big the barriers to accessing care are. And so we were able to rely a little bit on the fact of our very large consumer base, rely on our clinical data, and demonstrating the outcomes. And so it becomes a much easier conversation when some of those things line up. And, you know, as you mentioned, some companies go enterprise, some go consumer. I think we played it the right way. If we had gone direct enterprise without any consumer experience, I'm sure that we would not have been as successful as we were here. So it just kind of has worked out. Again, it, there is a true need in the healthcare system as well, and I think that's very important. It's not that we're bringing something out that isn't um, a, a true end user need. People need access to care, they struggle with it, and so we're helping solve those problems and being able to demonstrate that was really critical. Great, great. All right, final lightning round. I'm gonna ask for one word from each of you that summarizes what you're doing and your hope. We've heard a lot of words and buzzwords and phrases today, you know, data, empowerment, uh, efficiency, responsibility. Um, let's end on one word. Who goes first? Clinical quality. Nice. That's two words. So Hyphenated. Okay, quality. <laughs> Hyphenated, it's okay. <laughs> um, then I'm going four words. <laughs> so my, my word was going to be chaos. I think we need to embrace that this is a chaotic space and that the world is a bit chaotic. Um, but I would say chaos with a purpose, if I can use a couple words. <laughs> um, I think the word is value. Um, healthcare is just basically too expensive in the U.S., and we wanted to solve for that. I'm going I'm to steal your word empowerment, actually. I think it's, uh, it's about empowering Great. patients Great. and providers. Perfect. All right. Well, my word is thank you. Thank <laughs> you.